Everyone, everyone, please take your seats. We're about to start in a couple minutes. So if you have a ticket, please come inside the plenary hall and take a seat. There's also seats upstairs. And the other people sitting outside or in front. And if we have possibilities, we'll let more people in. But we have to, because of fire warden, really be strict about that. Thank you.
apparently I have to make exactly five inches distance from the mic. Voilà. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Gina, for sharing this, uh, this video of uh, one of the projects from the Sankofa. What we will discuss about this afternoon is the practice of Gina and Nathalie, who are both deeply connected between art and activism. And uh, thank you so much, Nikita, for such an inspiring and generous title, like when we're talking about imagination. So yes, we will talk about imagination. We will talk about utopia. But most of all, we will talk about actions and strategies to make sure that we are able to protect and to make sure that these visions of the future are something happening and that something that stays. So I would like to thank you both for being here. Um, Gina, you, your whole life uh, practice work is at this um, moment of encounter between entertainment and uh, activism. You are uh, the co-director of the Sankofa Initiative uh, that your father, Harry Belafonte, created. And um, before giving you the floor so that you share with us some of the experiences and you tell us a little bit more about Sankofa, uh, I will briefly introduce also Nathalie, whose um, interdisciplinary approach seeks to challenge the one single history, to bring together different narratives, to transmit them through different practices visual art, performance, but also teaching practices as a form of activism. So um, after you, for you sharing some video with, uh, with us of, uh, of your work, I will ask the two of you some questions about um, this challenging of the one single history and the work that you do to open up this dialogue and how you transmit these forms of knowledges. Gina, c'est à toi. Thank you. Uh, for starters, I would like to acknowledge our ancestors and acknowledge the sacred ground that we are on and those of us, um, those who have come before us, those who have paved a way for us. I think uh, there are, there's often times when we walk through the world or come into spaces where we are not uh, deeply connected to not only one another, but even just the space that we're in. So I want to take this opportunity for all of us together on the count of three, perhaps, to acknowledge the ancestors by taking a collective breath together. So on three, we'll inhale and then we'll exhale, okay? So one, two, three, inhale. And exhale. And one more time together on three, one, two, three, inhale. And exhale. Thank you. This offers me an opportunity to sort of ground myself in this moment and also um, for us to um, sort of mark a transition in um, disciplines and in um, the execution of, of how we're going to interact on this, in the space. Um, my name is Gina Belafonte. I am uh, from the United States, and I'm the co-director of an organization founded by my father called Sankofa.org. Sankofa is a word from Ghana. It's a Ghanaian word meaning go back and get it. And um, I am practicing the literal translation of that. I'm going back and getting the wisdom of not only my father, but of my community and uh, learning more and more as I go and using what I've learned from before in order to move forward. <clears throat> One of our main focuses in Sankofa is to use art as a strategic tool uh, a tool to organize. So we fancy ourselves as cultural organizers. We call ourselves artivists. Um, we work in, with artists, thought leaders, and well-known celebrities and community leaders and organizations in partnership with grassroots movements to shine a light on particular issues. We work with um, a lot of uh, first responding 
uh, issues. For instance, um, something happened to a young man in a city in New York, um, excuse me, in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, where he was shot down by a police officer. His name was Mike Brown Jr. And when he was murdered by this police officer, the young people predominantly, but the people of St. Louis and this particular town of Ferguson emerged into the streets in protest of the actions of this police officer. And when we got notice and heard of what happened, we as cultural organizers went down there immediately for a multiplicity of reasons. One was because we wanted to see what was actually happening and we wanted to be on the ground immediately so that our um, perspectives could be first-hand knowledge and not what the media was uh, portraying and what the media was saying, but we wanted to be down in St. Louis with the people. From that um, experience, as we were down there, emerged a lot of networking and relationships, and we were able to build upon those relationships with some of the cultural leaders of St. Louis. A lot of the hip hop community, a lot of the young people came out and emerged in ways that were uh, new for them. And um, we were able at Sankofa to, um, to not only bring artists down there in, of well-known stature in the United States to support the efforts of the community and to shine a light on what the community was doing, um, we took our lead from the community. We never tell a community what we think they should do. We always ask the questions of what is going on and, and, and look for those answers from the community. And we used the time and, and the opportunity to uh, shine a light not only on Ferguson, but to work with the community leaders there and their cultural community leaders and uh, create cultural events on the ground immediately um, as the protests were happening as the um, um, community continued to emerge and young people continued to emerge to find ways in which that they could be more participatory in the democracy of, of their city. So I'm going to just show a few more examples of the work of Sankofa and then we can maybe get into a bit of a discussion about it and if you want to also show your work as well so that we can keep it sort of a conversation and a flow. So this is a piece that was created uh, at a festival that we did. Um, 7 11, destruction of property in progress. Destruction of property in progress, 12,421 Horizon Village. 12421 Horizon Village, apartment J. John. Oh, you cannot just go about. If it's once or twice, you can say it's an accident and a coincidence. But when you have as large a population of murdered young men in the streets of America, and they're all black or African-American descent, I think there's somebody sending us a message, and we should respond to that message. They burst in, tasered the 68-year-old man, fired non-lethal beanbags at him, then Officer Anthony Corelli shot and killed him. We're being hunted every day. It's a silent war against African-American people as a whole. Paul say a police officer shot and killed a man Wednesday night. The shooting occurred during a traffic stop in the suburban city of Falcon Heights. An official said a woman and child were in the car with the man when he was shot. That's, I've got a feeling that's about to happen. That looks like a bad dude, too, to be honest with you. Which way are they facing? Police one, they're facing westbound. Uh, I think he may have just been tasered. 
If you are white and you work in a black community and you are racist, you need to be ashamed of yourself. You stood up there and took an oath. If this is not where you want to work at, then you need to take your behind somewhere else. Look at this, police brutality right here. Police brutality right here. On the ground, on the ground. Target down! Target down! An arrest warrant has been issued for the former Atlanta police officer who shot and killed an unarmed man last month. After being pulled over for a missing license plate. He used excessive force and was not justified. But this was an act of cold-blooded murder and an attempt to cover it up afterwards. You are saying in one of the, the interview where you present the initiative Sankofa, you say that one of the key issues are currently, uh, we are currently addressing include the systemic violence that has poisoned our society and is being reinforced by legislation such as Stand Your Ground. Could you explain a little bit more like what is this legislation and how, what are the means and strategies that you are using to to address that question and challenge that kind of status quo? Well, um, there is a young group of organizers in Florida, in the United States, by the name of the Dream Defenders, who chained themselves to the desk of the governor's office in protest uh, of the murder of Trayvon Martin, who was a young man, um, a young boy, really, um, who was murdered um, by a psychopath. Um, and what they did was they chained themselves to the desk of the governor's office uh, in protest of this law, Stand Your Ground, which is meaning if you feel, um, so in Florida it's an open carry state, which means you can carry a gun around if you have a license. Um, and Stand Your Ground basically means that if you feel threatened, you can defend yourself and if you happen to kill someone in the process of defending yourself, uh, you will not be prosecuted because it is a stand your ground law. Um, and I'm not a lawyer, uh, nor I, do I work for the government, so I'm hoping that my translation of that is accurate. Um, so um, what we do is uh, a couple of things. During a protest or during an organization of a march, we look to the artistic community to help create posters, slogans, um, agitprop theater, um, concerts. We look to celebrities who are um, feeling uh, related to the issue to support and show because many of their fans uh, will then also be interested in participating and understanding more deeply around the issue and what it is. And then using art as a tool in this way, like that, what we call a public service announcement, uh, which is what that last video was. Um, listening to the um, police radio and to the outcry of the community, showing a mixture of well-known American artists with other visual artists and community leaders that are not as well-known. Um, we, we want to find other ways that people can digest the information, and hopefully through the arts, we open hearts and minds, and so there is another level of connectivity and another level of digesting the information. Um, and so 
for the Stand Your Ground law in particular, we thought this was a, an important way in which to, to show how the, the many uh, communities and many people use this Stand Your Ground law as an excuse to um, use their fear and racist w ways um, legal. So uh, let me show you another. Um, so something else that we've been working on uh, most recently in Sankofa is using multiple art forms, because we hope to be able to work in every cultural medium. So uh, in January, and then again in March, we um, took over, and I'm sorry, you have to trans translate it in, uh, into metrics, but we took over 100,000 square foot space, uh, which is a big space, <laughs> And uh, we built walls from the ground up to uh, create a gallery. And um, the first installation of visual art and uh, sculpture uh, was a narrative around um, homelessness, houselessness, uh, income disparity, uh, really taking a look at the poor, and uh, incarceration. And we created an, um, a... Um, curriculum, uh, sort of, uh, and we had docents that took uh, students and, and people who came to visit. It was a free exhibit on a tour of the space and um, started to open up the conversation around the issues that plague the city of Los Angeles in particular uh, and the, the state of California around homelessness and um, income issues and mass incarceration. Um, we had over 80 hours of programs, of panel discussions, of workshops. We had uh, concerts and uh, um, dance workshops and, and music. And then in March, we did the same thing again because we found it successful. In one week, we had, um, sorry, in 10 days, we had about 37,000 people come through the exhibit. And then in March, we just did it again. And this time, we focused on a specific issue of mental health and wellness. And we worked with the city um, to put on this show. And we had, I think, about 22,000 people come through, um, which included um, between 300 and 500 busloads of schools uh, of children that came through to see the work, to get a deeper understanding. And this is sort of just a little um, example of, of what that is. <laughs> So you said before that uh, you're using the art as a tool to listen. And Nathalie, something that comes a lot in your, in your practice and bringing back to the surface, to the surface um, a lot of the silence uh, stories. And um, if you could share with us a little bit more about your practice, and then I will ask you a couple of questions. And then we will open to the public. But before that, we will also show an excerpt of uh, Kader Atia's video. Uh, unfortunately, Kadar could not be there with us today, uh, but uh, we, will, uh, we will see a little excerpt of one of his latest video installations that he showed at Palermo. So I'm just, okay, so I'm just going to show you a selection of work that was done over the last four or five years, and it's done. <laughs> uh, 
um, and uh, thinking about how to uh, work with communities. So uh, I've been traveling, living in different countries, uh, and uh, one of the things is, uh, that I work with is ha having to do work with people, with communities on site, to think about uh, historical memory. Uh, and how to deal with uh, a common narrative uh, that uh, very often is subdued uh, or oppressed uh, within uh, different spaces or institutions that are not legitimized uh, as historical. Um, and, uh, bon. <laughs> I don't know, because I think this is on the automatic view. Yeah. Uh, well, it's about imagination, so <laughs> a couple of <laughs> minutes by the time we set it up. <laughs> I wonder if you can go back. Huh? Maybe this way is better? Yeah, you got it. Yeah. I don't know. Let's try. Or maybe I show it like this. No, it's not very. Uh... Yes, because uh... yeah, it's fine. It's good. No, it's okay. Yeah, because I can see as well. Okay, that's fine. So a lot of the 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 work I've been doing is actually thinking about uh, knowledge outside of uh, references of the academy. So. Uh, I left the academy uh, in London after five years of teaching full time, and I learned nothing uh, f from uh, being a student there. I, I learned nothing from my supervisors. I learned nothing from the books that were given to me. Uh, they were very limited in terms of choices and content and how the discourse were set. Uh, and actually everything that I required, all the knowledge that I practice, uh, that is active, uh, I learned it from my students over the five years. So uh, that knowledge is something that also you have to create, that you have to invent, and that you have to build. Uh, a lot of the things that, you know, um, that I, uh, I grew up with or uh, I was fed were some things that could not be touched, were some things that were kept by gatekeepers and tell you this is the knowledge and this is the history. If it's not there, therefore it's non-existent. Uh, so it became that my own presence in these spaces or my own history uh, didn't exist, uh, was not present because it was not spoken about. Um, and I was really interested in this dimension of working with the body. Um, why I work with the body? Because it's also coming from a personal experience with battling with uh, leukemia cancer, uh, which still reverberates in your everyday habit or practice. So you, when you are in different places, you know, you, you, you learn your blackness or your color or your, your status or your place by others around you. That will define your contour of what shadow you become and how you move in the space. So uh, a lot of the places like this was, in, for example, in Colombia, in the Parque de Independencia. Um, and it was looking at this idea of uh, energy and ley lines. Um, it used to be a formal uh, in indigenous sacred space where they did rituals and performances and narrations, which is now built over concrete. Um, and some of these stones that you see, they are sweating. The trees also, they are sweating red raisin, like blood. Uh, and these mark the ley lines. The ley lines is a point of energy on earth where uh, energy is very high. So on these points of the stone, this is what was happening. Um, and one of the things was to reconstruct uh, an, an old carousel from the 1960s, uh, which paralleled with the history of uh, independence. Uh, and the carousel started to, to move on, on its own. So I work a lot with, with this dim dimension of what you cannot see because you have to come back to the body, knowing to understand that it's an archive, that it's a speech. Uh, that you have to be able to speak with. So one of the projects that was really interesting for me was uh, working um, uh, in Leipzig where they reconstructed an exhibition 
uh, but without the objects, without images, and just lay down the, the debris of, of the categories of uh, what was described as uh, you know, cultures from the Germanic uh, point of view. Uh, and, and then taking, accompanying these people through this history, through uh, sonic uh, intervention, without relying on these objects or images. When I came to Berlin, one of the things I um, started to look at was just speaking with the community. Uh, and being Berliner was also meaning that you speak in different languages. You know, you creolize the language, you creolize the space, you creolize the narrations. Um, and this work was uh, a photographic series uh, that had to deal with the, um, the memory of, of uh, colonial uh, uh, history and, and how the descendants, how these uh, children are speaking. Uh, so it was very symbolic. The work was uh, uh, um, an exercise of ancestral work, uh, which I do, which is very private, as a one-to-one, -one, which deals with the the myth, the narration, the imagination of the person that has ingrained into the, uh, to his subconscious, and how they would deliver it uh, as a statement, as their own body, as a, as a monument. Okay. Uh, uh, later, uh, uh, when I was working with archives, I worked on a, a project uh, called Squat Monument with uh, also Anna Isero, where we're thinking about what is the debris of the history of Germany? Because you know, one of these things when you come into communities in the city is like, you know, this idea of integration and again and diversity and who you are and you know, like, but you don't have the right accent. What 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 does the the color of your skin tells you where you come from? It's not right. Na na na. Um, but also the debris of what is left over in the city. You know, what what does it mean to be German? Uh, and uh, one of the things is, I um, think about the metaphor of the, the Trumenberg, so think about the history of the, the war uh, after the Second World War, when we find all these mounds around the city, or these little hills, they're actually what they call here Trumenbergs, which are the debris of the city collected by women and, and, and men after the war, uh, which became a metaphor to uh, how to look at uh, um, this colonial uh, reflection and empire which uh, uh, insist, uh, what, insisted to stay and remains actually. So it was a lot of the work at the beginning was, to, was archival work, um, but I, the choice was not to uh, reproduce or represent these images and put them back on the wall and say, this is the photo, this is the proof, this is the legitimize that exists. Uh, this is how heavy the history. You know, as a descendant, it's very difficult when you have to deal with the, the, the photos no, of your own uh, grandfathers and grandmothers uh, being put into this anthropological, ethnological setting uh, and being capitalized on it. And, and us having to respond, uh, you know, uh, in very limited ways. So the idea was to transform this collection, and uh, one of the things was focusing on the, the voices of women as well, uh, and what happened to them, uh, why uh, this visibility was very low, why in these phonographic records that you can find here in Berlin, there are many photo, uh, um, phonographic records, recordings from the Laura Kiev that's held by the Humboldt University, you have the Lamen collection, you have the Hans Lickenecker collection that is connected to Namibia, uh, and how in all these huge collections, you notably have voices of men, and uh, because they are uh, colonial soldiers. Uh, but the voices of women, you hardly, you hardly hear. However, it doesn't mean that they were not there, doesn't mean that they not existed. It's just because it's a question of accessibility and the limitation of technology. So a phonograph recording works like this. It always starts by an A tone. Ah. Anything that goes beyond the A tone, it probably the, the technology won't be able to record it. And that's what happened basically. So the, a, a lot of the, the recordings could not record the extreme high pitch of women. Uh, and uh, it, it was, it was um, described that you know, the, the cultural production of our own narrative, of our, of our own culture, could only be done by the tone, the voice of men and not of women. So a lot of the, the, the archives of these women, they come not just from public archives here, 
you, you have, you know, I, I was working archives not just in uh, Berlin but uh, across different cities, also in Hamburg, uh, in, uh, in Switzerland, in Lisbon, in Brazil. And one of the things that's very interesting is about the absence, about the censorization, you know, the blackness. And actually, that blackness, censorization, not being able to read the text or see the images, will tell you much more about the narration of what is going on and the political choices and these visions of uh, uh, of these collections, knowing that you have to understand in that way all archives are false because they are being selected and produced by the very few people, usually men, who decide how history should be told. So you, it, it, and that's what I mean, we have to reinvent, we have to learn how to make fiction in order to have this truth uh, and, and, and this freedom to reclaim and to come back to our own narratives. So a lot of these women came from private albums, from families which were not published and they arrived in the archives without knowing their identities. Only very few we know what they did, but one of the things was is that they're also part of uh, groups of resistance movements, for example, that uh, were happening not just in Namibia, in South Africa, in Cameroon, but also right back in Berlin. And of course, what, you, what happens in, in, in Berlin is that you have this whole generations of women, from the end of the 19th century till up to the second uh, and after the, the Second World War, uh, who conglomerated and organized these um, black resistance movements. And often, um, in very few testimonies, you, you will read that it was a struggle also because there were different black communities. There wasn't a singular appropriation of it, but also the exclusion by the black men also, who didn't want them to be part of this membership. And so they had to work within this kind of queering their identities and choosing different names to move into the spaces and in these positions. So one of the, the things I show you video now is uh, uh, We Build the Kilimanjaro. So it will show you. So it will show you the. Ich habe es nur fast vergessen all die Jahre lang. Ich bin ja auch ein Pflichtvergessener, wie die sagen. Du bist mein Karlemann. Wenn die auch schreien und trampeln, komm nach Hause und sei nicht traurig. Ich bin nicht traurig, Mutter. Lass die Krakela schreien und trampeln, so viel sie wollen. Meine Idee, meine Kolonie können die doch nicht zertrampeln. Bring. Bring. Wenn wir beide nicht mehr sind und wenn die da drin schon lange nicht mehr sind, dann steht immer noch ein Berg in Afrika, 6000 Meter hoch, der Kilimanjaro, als der ewiges Wahrzeichen für deutsches Afrika. I just want, this can be silent if you want. So the idea is the, the scene you saw there was the last scene of the film biography, Carl Peters, that was made by Herbert Selpin in 1942. And there's a whole collection of colonial films you can find from the Weimar Republic up to the Second World War and afterwards into the um, uh, DDR. Uh, and how the, the movie industry was really key for a lot of these women and men to transmit memory, to transmit their forms of resistance. So in, in the film you saw that the, the statue behind is the actual Ziegelsäule, the maquette. Uh, and, so, uh, and then it's being basically superimposed, very phallically superimposed by the Kilimanjaro, which became the symbol of German Africa. So, and on all these movies you have then this narration of this invention of this culture of 
what Africa is like. And Africa is Berlin. You know, we talk about look at the the, the letters of uh, Otto von Bismarck when he speaks to his children. He had also. Uh, African and Indian adopted children as a way to invest into colonial expeditions uh, that talk about Africa as Berlin that is not interested in even in the continent it's it's about creating a uh, yes uh, an Africa yes. so and, and this you know you have it all, all the time you know whenever you you often see movies documentaries that 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 that, that that's not my culture, you know, that's not my language, that's not my people, that's not... Uh, so then the idea to disassemble, to dismantle this, uh, you know, like, uh, um, uh, the symbol, the symbol of this Kilimanjaro uh, uh, was to invite uh, women, local women that uh, we know, uh, who are also artists, activists in their right, writers, whose history is also connected to this colonial memory and uh, reciting some of these memories of their great-grandfathers. So, for example, we have Matilda here, uh, who's also an artist and a poet in her own right, uh, who I worked with uh, for two years, and she just published her book, The Foreign Me, um, where she's uh, talking, basically, or dealing with the memory uh, of her uh, great-grandfather, who was a colonial soldier, and held in Germany and across Europe. And this, this diary survived. Um, but the way to transmit it is through her own voice. So this is very important also that this idea of transmission, that it comes from the grandchildren, that it's spoken through their own voice. So this is something that, uh, that uh, you, you will see reoccurring in the work. Uh, and then there's another one. So like a lot of the way to also think about this context. So if you have these symbols, these props being produced, you know, by the time of the Second World War, you have a lot of these African soldiers and uh, uh, women uh, from America, Europe, uh, Africa, who are part of this cultural industry. And um, when you see some of the movies from the Second World War, uh, some of the movies including uh, Victory in the West, they will actually uh, shoot uh, the black actors on the screen. So when I say shoot, I don't mean just literally shooting uh, the film, but shooting with guns. Uh, and so there has been no uh, burial or acknowledgement of these criminal activities that's been set in Berlin. And a lot of them are part of this debris of, of this park. So to find a way to, f to, to, you know, to make these testimonies uh, and these rituals of burial and commemoration through acts of performance that can be accessible because you're really trying to, to change the locality of the habit of everyday life uh, and inviting people to join. So, and then the l l last one. Um, okay. So, you know, the idea is that to bring out, you know, th this idea of the museum institution, just like the academia, it's, it's almost like uh, it's not accessible to everybody, you know, uh, and people won't be able to go because of what it symbolizes. Uh, so the idea was to create a form, a structure that you can infiltrate or squat these spaces where the memory is still there, this debris is still there, but you can access with, with them and trigger something in you. So it triggers your own memory and creates a cultural archive that is not decided by uh, an institution or uh, legitimized by a board, uh, but is created by the active community uh, uh, all together. So this will be interventions in, in different ways and materials, whether it's like little films, or with, with sonic sounds, or with workshops, and uh, taking these objects out and making these processions, these ceremonies, through speaking about these stories uh, and these ideas. Another thing about fiction, which is very important, is that um, the limitation of archiving is that it has to be, uh, you know, it's about this, also this idea of, you know, academic referencing, like, you know, my argument is only legitimized if I have this reference, right? But every reference is according to your own understanding of it. Um, one of the things is with this project uh, was uh, on the ruins of paradise to connect 
the biographies or the experiences of six women, so you have three German women and uh, three black women who are ghosts, and they're in conversations with each other. Uh, it's very difficult to have material about what happened to them. You know, you, you will not find a book about them or even no archive about them, but you will find the traces through these uh, um, uh, movies or these sounds, the jazz music, or even um, through the sounds. So for example, with Maria Mandesibel, who was one of the adopted uh, children from King Mandesibel uh, in Cameroon, is that her son became one of the most famous poets, David Diop of Negritude, and a lot of what he wrote inspired and was rewritten by Unika Tsum, who is, is, was a very uh, also uh, known uh, German female surrealist painter and, and novelist. And the work that they did through their writing uh, relates their experiences in terms of women, uh, thinking about this uh, feminist space, but also this idea of the experience of coloniality. Uh, that it's not just anymore um, uh, just to dig through these uh, material, but to transform it. So thinking about stations for them and how to interact them. So when you are in the space, you, you are producing this form of knowledge and of memory for your own experience uh, and creating stations of creation where you will put this memory uh, on paper and create the the alternative ending to Carl Peters, let's say, yeah, for example. Uh, so a lot of it also is through sonic uh, experiences, uh, going to former places that were, uh, uh, how, how do you say, like um, slave markets, uh, and, and there are many in Scandinavia that they don't know about, <laughs> and how to interrupt them and how to make this this echo uh, return. Uh, so here you go, the symbol of the Kilimanjaro, which is then shot on uh, Vedding Zendjun, uh, Dengmal. Uh, also, so this, this idea of, uh, of the locality of the neighborhood uh, become is created as the African village, the African set. And then taking to these people to these spaces uh, and interrupting, intervening, acting together to create these narratives to understand what these sites mean and the relations, the parallels of, of these images. Uh, so this is, for example, one of the, the images of, of these archives of, of women that are not known, who were part of, of these generations of resistance movement and how they uh, transmitted their uh, strategies and methods uh, of survival across continents. Um, and then going back again to the testimony, not just of people, but uh, of, of nature as well, thinking about the nature of Kilimanjaro that was so tamed in its own image and its own vision, uh, but thinking about the sounds of the plants speaking as a way of testifying, and their, their vibration differentiates according not to species, but according to places. So that means according to events that happened uh, on site. Um, and then the one thing I wanted to show you here, last thing. Uh, this was also uh, a work to do with uh, looking at the, the debris of uh, the colonial camp, one of the colonial camps in Wunsdorf, uh, just outside Berlin, uh, that used some of these actors uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, for these movies, for example. I'm 
Who will print and who will tell? Who will tell after the war? Does the war have to be over before stories about the war can be printed? Who tells during the war? And why are these stories not heard than the grand words of the king and his children? Which stories will stay and which stories will not? So uh, this is I did you uh, return to the site where this colonial camp was built in 1915 uh, until 1921, then it was demolished. It was a place where they first built the first official mosque in Germany, which was uh, uh, created not for the, the soldiers who were Muslims to pray. They were praying outside. Uh, they, it was built basically for show, so that for when diplomats came uh, or people were visiting, a bit like human zoo context, uh, they would prove to the enemy or to their political counterparts that we treat the soldiers the best in, in, in Germany and, and not elsewhere. Um, so when you go back to the site now, uh, 100, exactly 100 years after it was built, uh, they rebuilt the same structure right on top, uh, uh, and these blue uh, um, cabins for uh, Syrian refugees at the time. Yeah, so this is what between 2015. Uh, till now, N now I'm not sure what happened to it because the, the politics are, are, are changing significantly. Uh, but a lot of this debris is still there. And a lot of this debris of these camps are very, very often uh, put into the water, into nearby lakes. So they, to imagine what do the memories and, uh, of, of um, these people have left in the water, how does it speak? So we're talking about this also this imagination of the Mamiwata, the transformation, but also this idea of the, the Drexia, of the, the resurfacing, and all these testimonies coming from uh, phonograph recordings that are being retold by the descent young women, then uh, they, they also uh, tell stories about women, and that's how the women reappear within these collections. Uh, you know, so uh, uh, this new myth, this uh, debris, uh, uh, come out. But on that, um, mm. that's the. Did I respect the right size? Yes. Can you hear me? Um, that's that's very. What is really beautiful about your uh, how you're challenging the whole, for instance, the relationship with the archaeology in relation to uh, the ecosystem or the scientific or academic archive. When you bring in the idea of cultural archive. And you're saying that um, you're working with spaces to trigger a memory and to share stories. And uh, on that, Gina, there is a lot of, um, of resonance when, uh, when you're talking about the translation of uh, Sankofa and you're saying it is like you must reach back to reclaim that which is lost in order to move forward. So in some way, it is also some strategy to resist against like a one single history. And um, if you could tell us a little bit more about like, how you open up the access to this, um, to this entangled stories, to this past and moving towards, towards the future. Well, first I want to just applaud the work that you do. It's amazing. Um, I, I, I'm, you know, I started in my life as an as an actress, um, and as an actress, the work that I did was always somebody else's writing, and so I'm always so um, inspired when I see artists uh, with their own original work and content, and um, how they translate their heart and mind um, through their art. It's it's quite amazing. Um, what was the question? Don't remember. Don't remember, okay. So, no, it's uh, the connection oh. like, between the past, the stories of the past. Stories of the past, the, right. The future. Well, um, you know, um, the, uh, I, uh, I am certainly not an, an, an aficionado on, on this at all, but I, I will say that um, for too long, the stories that have been told predominantly about people of color have always been told by people who are not of color who tell them. And I think that we are um, in a time where there is a bit more 
uh, space and recognition for artists who are most impacted by either the issue or, or whatever's in the content to come forward and, and more platforms for us to, to bring this work forward. Um, I'm really um, in the business of telling the story of then, now, and tomorrow. So my work is really inspired by what content is being presented as an opportunity for me to partner and share in. Um, I, um, on occasion, get an opportunity to create my own work. But for the most part, I find venues, spaces, and places, platforms, and ways in which to elevate content that is speaking to a specific issue that, that, that hits me. Um, there's a lot of work that Sankofa is currently engaged in. Um, and we do everything from work with the young students with the March for Our Lives and helping them bring forward their message to, uh, we're right now working on a piece, as I was telling you earlier, about the colonization of the Congo and uh, the Belgian experience and experiment there. Um, and looking at a, a way to um, tell that story, uh, there's a lot of information from the Belgian perspective, but very little from the Congolese perspective. So there's a lot of research right now that we're in and we're doing um, in an effort to make sure that the Congolese voice is part of that story. And it will be a modern television experience. And um, before I forget again, I just wanted to make note of something that I find very interesting in this conversation about post-colonial, and I'm so not an academic, um, but what I find really interesting about a lot of the things that we tend to do culturally is um, create spaces that I feel colonized in. Like even this format of discourse for me is so interesting to be sort of up here and presenting to you as if I have some extremely wise, I mean, I mean, I don't want to discount who I am and what my history is and what I might, you know, be able to um, um, uh, inspire, but um, this format is a very interesting um, way in which to, we continually uh, exchange ideas, and um, I, I just keep wondering if there's a way to do this in circle, like in a circle, or or in some other, or in a triangle, or I don't know, just in some other shape than than this um, kind of experience. Um, so I, I mean, I would like to actually show some more work, if I can, of, of some of the stuff that we've been working on and doing, um, if I can find it. <laughs> No, that's yours. OK, hold on. Um, and I, the reason why I, I would rather show than, than, um, than uh, OK, this is not it. Sorry. Hold on. I'll tell you when. <laughs> um, is because I feel like the work in some ways speaks for itself. And um, we, um, I, I'm a content creator. Uh, and and so uh, yeah, so I feel like the work in in some ways uh, speaks for itself. So um, let me show. Uh, we did a we did a, a um, um, art festival in in the United States, a two day art festival where we brought um, artists to do a, sort of a traditional music festival style, and um, often they have. Um, DJs that play in between the live music sets. So instead of having DJs, we had people like Angela Davis and Brian Stevenson and others come to speak in between the musical acts. And this, um, and we tried to do um, something a little bit different where we invited the community to come in to listen to some of our thought leaders and artists in conversation with each other. And um, I just want to show you what that sort of looks like. Uh, and then I'll show you one other clip of, of a theater piece that uh, we're currently working on. Okay. Why do you search for me? I look for you too. 
You just bring trouble, 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 yes you do. Why do you hate for me? I hate you too. You just bring trouble, 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 yes you do. We come to multiply. You take and divide. You just bring trouble, 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 why, oh why? Cursing, you hate for me. You too. You just bring trouble, 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 yes you do. You just bring trouble, 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 yes you do. Why do you hate for me? I know you do. You just bring trouble, 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 yes you do. Why do you hate for me? I know you do. You just bring trouble. So, so that gives you an idea of what we tried to in, engage in the two days we were there. We had live visual, we had visual artists painting live there while the music was playing. We had over 50 organizations uh, from around the country uh, there with information about what they're doing and how for how the people that came as guests to the festival could. Uh, engage in the work that they were doing across the United States. We had speakers who were captivated at the, in the moment by the music and their hearts were open and they were dancing and enjoying. And then you have uh, a, a thought leader come forward to give some hard evidence and uh, uh, data around an issue or talk to them about how they can get more uh, agency for themselves and their communities and participate. Um, we had representation from um, as many communities as we could incorporate, the, Mus the Muslim community, the Native American community, the Latin American community, the black community, the white community. Um, and we had um, some very, very high profile artists like Carlos Santana and Dave Matthews and Macklemore and T.I. And we also had Tef Poe and Jasiri X and Rebel Diaz. And these are young local artists from across the country. Um, that we also had shared the stage so that there was um, sort of uh, a shining light on their work as well. And um, all of this is in the spirit of Sankofa in terms of reclaiming. It's not just uh, going back to move forward, but it's also in some ways reclaiming and, um, and creating new narratives uh, of past narratives in order to move forward. Um, and so, and so many interesting things come out of that work because when you work uh, with another artist, you're inspired by what they, uh, their perspective or what their, um, their uh, art has brought forward or how it's touched you. And then taking that and moving that forward in creating yet another piece of art or engaging in another kind of discourse is, uh, is, is really what is most exciting to me and using art and culture as a tool. Um, and I feel like much of the work in academia or much of the work in, in government or in other institutions and in art institutions too, that we need to find more interdisciplinary opportunities and more ways in which that we can bring our work together and share practices. And uh, you know, I was so, um, I was so inspired by, by the, the, the previous speakers and then my friend comes who's a, an amazing choreographer and I'm thinking how can those people collaborate in ways uh, you know, to, to, to transform the written word and the concept of oration into a physical expression um, with the same or the, a similar intention. Um, so, and then I'll show one more thing I wanted to show. Um, and then maybe we can. Hmm. 
Hmm. So this is... Um, I have to minimize this so I can, here it is. Um, so this is um, a piece that um, is a documentary film that's not out yet. And we are um, in the process of um, getting more resources to finish it. But it shows uh, the work of three social justice activists in, in the United States and, and their work. And I won't play the whole thing, but I, I'd like to show a portion of it. The first time I ran into freedom, she was smoking a cigarette, lounged on the curb, sipping on a sweating beer bottle, mumbling toward the sky, her elbows shivering on her knees, waving me over. I was on my way to change the world somewhere. I don't really remember where exactly. I was in a hurry, though. And perhaps I never stopped. Had she not appeared so familiar, her face photographed in Internet connection? I have an inter mask. Inter mask. Yeah. <laughs> it's our day with oh. technology today. So, okay, so this film uh, follows the lives of three young women who are so familiar. Her face photographed in my mind, hewing and celestial. I remember her hair. Night and twilight flew down her back, water falling into the air. She is a working woman. Woke up every morning at dawn, eavesdropping on the souls of black folk rushing and dazed, weary and struggling. She noted the children, tumbling and scraped knees. The mother, parched and inevitable. The fathers, freakishly bamboozled, bound in shadows. This is life. She inhaled an opera of smoke and exhaled an orchestra of pain. Told her I had to be on my way. And she cleverly replied, oh, that's right. You have to go change the world. <laughs> My okay, so um, what I would, I wish, what I will do is I'll sort of let it continue to play if it, if it catches up to itself um, and just speak. So, so, this is a piece about um, three social justice activists um, who um, are on the front lines of many of the, uh, of the movements and the work that we do in the United States. One of them, uh, two of them are twin sisters, um, and they work together for, for quite some time until they both decided to, to move into different um, areas of the work, and another one of the women is a woman who has been working with us for over uh, 15 years, and she was one of the organizers of the National um, Women's March, and um, and they do a lot of frontline work, and 
we are taking the opportunity to do a documentary film to highlight their work, as many documentary films do, but we're using art and, and different cultural um, mediums to also uh, help in the creation of the documentary so that it's not just a straight format of, a, of, a, of, a, of how we usually see um, documentary films. Um, these women have been organizers on, for the Black Lives Matter movement, um, for the uh, Justice League movement, and, um, I, and I wish this was caught up and that it wasn't so much uh, interference so that you could actually uh, really see and, and see how remarkable they are. Um, but I also find that there's certain, um, <laughs> I'm gonna be bold here, but there's certain colonial points of view for me, even in, the, in, in looking at art and in looking at the way in which we present art um, in mainstream media forms. And it, I think that, you know, in so many ways, so many of us have been so institutionalized in the way in which we even imagine and conceive our work that, uh, except for you, because you didn't learn anything from the institution that you were in, right? Um, but that there might be other ways that we can even imagine the creation of work. Yeah. And I think on, on that, one of the term is this accessibility. And it's the language that you use, but it's also one of your um, mission is this accessibility of the languages. And it's also something that, yes, you said you didn't learn anything from the university, but you continue to teach. And it's how you're teaching. And this accessibility, which I find absolutely amazing, and if you can tell us like a couple of examples of, um, yeah, you're, you're teaching at the, at the UDK, at the Humboldt, at the University of Vermont, and you are uh, reverting these tools and um, yeah, so basically what I do is I, I, I um, mm. share everything that wasn't taught to me or everything that was taught, I create a space of untraining and unlearning so that you are able to, uh, to create your own voice, your own memory within the spaces. So it was very important for me when I, because when I left the academy, it was uh, uh, quite a, a shock also because all these students wanted to, um, uh, they wanted to continue, they wanted to stay. And, and they, you know, there's a, you, you can't just leave. They, you know, they are there with you. You have, you have set a certain space of intimacy as well and of trust uh, and a way of triggering something that didn't happen before. But they are doing the work uh, and the labor. So what, what I do is basically give triggers so that this labor, this cultural archive is produced by uh, these people. And when I say students, you know, they are between 18 to 65, you know, it's not, uh, but it's, it's funny about this idea of position of, of the past in relation to the present because I think it's very clear also with what you're presenting here, you know, we are reclaiming and are making clear our positioning on the present in order to heal or to repair the past. It's everything to do with the present. And one thing I, I learned also when you have to deal with this topic, when you work with other people or other institutions, you know, working collaborations, uh, I really want to also mention the name of Memory Biwa, who, who I'm working with, who've, who've done significant uh, work also on this idea of the archive and the voice of women, uh, was that there's a big difference when you do work that's a representation or a topic of something because it's a topic of interest and that's why you do it. Or you do it because you understand that you have no way to get out of it because this is your everyday life experience. It's a habit. So only you can tell that story. Then a person who has to take an angle from starting from an interesting topic and say this needs to, there's a, and, and this is what I see also with the with what you have shown with the examples is that, you know, uh, yes, we are living it. And there's a very big difference in terms of narration and in terms of dealing and doing uh, with the work and thinking about this decolonial method or, or strategy, which is very different than what you learn in the classroom or having this setting of, you know, this gap, the separation when actually the movement is about integrating and moving and, and having this conversation, this intimacy with people. You know, you never talk about intimacy within this... Yeah, archaeology of, of, of knowledge, which uh, uh, needs to change. So it's also our idea of limitations on temporality. 
And uh, one of the things, uh, the, the last thing I wanted to, to, not to show, but for you to hear, uh, is, is again based on, on uh, how to look at the strategy, the, the method of archiving or of, of noting down history. Um, so you have different sets of rules or parameters to say what is right and what fits in the science and what will be legitimized by the institutions to pay. So we know that who recorded these people, uh, in what way, for, for, for what purpose. Uh, however, so what about the voices of those who recorded us? Uh, so one of the things um, uh, that I, 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 this is personal story uh, that really kind of um, opens my, my perception also of my position in here. Uh, a few years ago, um, I went back to my uh, village. Uh, there's a place called Mimbang near Bitam, uh, where the, the war between the French and the German uh, happened. Uh, in 1914, so of course the Germans, uh, um, they, they, they lost the war, but they left a debris of carcasses of metals from the war that you can still find in the forest, so you will see cannons or guns or helmets from the soldiers that are lying across the, the rainforest. It is also the place where in the 1960s, when my father was a teenager, he worked on plantations of cacao, um, rubber, and banana, and so he was telling the story about how the the, the pirates were speaking on the experiences of uh, these colonial settlers, which um, with the German settlers in, in Mimbang, they stayed all over uh, until 1926, around this time. And, uh, and, and this is what happened. So I, I asked my father to tell me his story, but one of the things he says, I don't want you to record me. I don't want you to film me, and I don't want you to record my voice. I don't want you to do that. My grandmother said the same, but you can tell the story. You can say it. That's okay. You can say it. So um, uh, my grandmother also had this letter of the great grandfather, her father, who sent uh, a last letter to her, a suicidal note, when he was in the German camp, the labor German camp, as a colonial soldier, uh, and he died there. And this was his last uh, uh, message. And when you go into the forest. Uh, in Mimbang, this is what you, uh, a selection of, yes, records that you can hear of these conversations uh, of the German settlers that are talked by pirates. So I'm telling the story of what my father told me in the 1960s, how he built radio towers to send Don't frequencies. Feel my face. Don't record my voice but you can repeat it, you can mimic it, like a shadow follows an image. This you can do, and you won't destroy the order of things. Do not write what I say, because they will steal my story. So here you go, this is, the thing you have to understand in Gabon, it's francophone, so nobody speaks German anymore. Some of the German language has infiltrated within the, the phone. So only in that part of the rainforest in Mimbang, where the war happened, and the settlement uh, was, you will find pirates that speak German. And nobody knows why, nobody really investigated, you know, people are there like, uh, don't really, and this is what my father did when he was a child, he was shooting these pirates because the sound, the German sound was so overwhelming that they had to shoot them uh, Daddy, with slings. So it is still happening. Him, my it never ends. He tells me it's not the ended. The war has everything. not ended because it's still here in the memory. So this is an archive. How the nature, how this idea, of course, of the Kilimanjaro as a symbol, uh, uh, has recorded the perpetrators, has recorded the ones who recorded the because ones it is <laughs> from the other culture that they and invented. We are of Camisona. 
They shout her name all over the jungle. Who? And he talks about a woman called Kamisona. Kamisona. That Kamisona. in the local region people are afraid of. And nobody knows who she is. She takes your eyes and your fortune. And if you see money in trees, you don't touch it. Because that's when she comes. That's why he was building these radio towers. So that they will send her to sleep. So she wouldn't come out to them. Now, the sad thing is, is that they, the, the, the story ended because he was arrested by the local authority, thinking that they were sending uh, messages to the enemies on, across the border because there were conflicts going on in the region back then and still remains. Um, and Kamisona sounds a bit like um, the offer um, out of from Chamiso. And one of the things that you will find in most German colonies is a botanical garden with an amphitheater where they would perform local literature, mainstream literature. And this is what happened. So a lot of these languages and these sounds that were performed as a way to, to escape and entertain during the colony were then repeated and then created these new mythologies or, or again, you know, these, uh, these creatures of women that reappear and still embed as part of the real dimension of people's experience now and how they move into the space. To send our songs to Kamisona. You're out of battery. That's good. Thanks, <laughs> Fayal. I, um, I, I just wanted to, to add that, um, you know, there's a lot of freedom fighting going on around the world, and um, many of us often view ourselves, especially some of my elders in this work, we view, uh, they um, view themselves as part of the resistance and the resistance movement. And, Recently, we, we were having a discussion and, um, and I'm sort of revisiting this concept of um, resistance. And as well, while I resist, for instance, I definitely resist my current government in the United States. Um, I don't see myself as part of the resistance any longer. I see the government as the resistance. I see we as communities all over the globe who are bringing forth our, uh, the truth of our history and, um, and actually reclaiming the space and the air and, and the, the, the narrative, I feel like we're just the new world order coming forward, that the resistance is the Trump administration. The resistance are those who oppress us and continue to resist against love and against hope and uh, togetherness and a new way. Uh, I think that um, this idea of resistance is, um, is uh, I'm trying to reclaim the concept of that. And, and something else I wanted to say too is that um, I think that if racism and sexism and classism and all the isms that are negative isms. Um, if, if, we're, if, it, if it is the idea and the hope to sort of dismantle all of that and to get rid of that, I feel that we need to be um, in some ways realistic around the timing. It's gonna take generations, I think, of, of us uh, before we actually rid ourselves of this um, oppressive um, or violent way. And I think that um, the hope I have is that as we continue to be artivists and cultural organizers and thinkers and philosophers and academics and some politicians um, who want to make a shift and find a more equitable way of thinking and moving forward with one another, I feel like it's in, we need to continue to teach our children uh, to resist, but also to um, imagine um, sort of the origins of themselves 
in a way. And and because um, a lot of what's out of the conversation is our humanity um, with one another and our moral center and our conscience. And one of my mentors, one of my father's mentors, said that artists are, in fact, the gatekeepers of truth and that we are civilization's radical voice in many ways. And it is through art that, that we find a lot of the truth and the answer. And I feel the way, what we teach our young children, especially in the United States, our, our historical documents and our, our history books are, um, are, are fraudulent. They're, they're, they're not the truth. And they're also often perspectives from some patriarchal kind of um, supremacy. And we don't offer enough of um, indigenous and native truths to be taught, and I feel like the more we do that, um, and, and we've seen you know, many shifts happen in the LGBTQ movement, when they shifted narrative, when they shifted media, and there's more of a, an acceptance in some ways, and there's more of a, of, a, of, a, of a normalcy that our young people are growing up with, and I feel like if we continue in that way, perhaps in generations to come, we will actually find um, a new way forward because all of these, it feels like including in indigenous communities, there is the human element that is not really psychologically dealt with enough in terms of aggression or the need for, um, for uh, attention or and the way in which the human condition chooses to go out and pursue it through greed or through other mechanisms. And um, I'm, I'm just hopeful that if we continue to do this work that young people, young, young people, will begin to just soak it in as the norm and begin to shift and change as well. well I guess the, the, those generations are... I mean, those generations that are doing this work of, you know, sankofa uh, ing you know, mm -hmm. because it's about arriving and departing constantly. I mean, when we think about arriving in a place where everything will be done, no, the labor will still be there continuously, continuously. If slavery has been going on for thousands of years, even beyond the, what we can even produce as knowledge, you know, and, and I'm not just talking about the context between slavery, you know, uh, European, African slavery, uh, and the slave trade, but also, you know, uh, Arabic slavery, also the slavery that is going on now, also on the continent, uh, done by black men and communities, uh, who are oppressing and enslaving, most of the time it's women or, or children, and in different contexts, in, in, in that it's, it's, you know, the, there's all communities around, or even in India, or uh, in, you know, in Latin America, etc. So it's, it's something, I think it's about a work of tradition also, if we're talking about the study of the past tradition, I mean, I always say it's not about starting with an origin point and saying this is where it started and it's, it's, it's the truth. No, a tradition means it's a reinvention of yourself. Traditions are based on a reinvention of narrative of communities or certain people that are transmitted throughout as a way of survival. And what we try to do in this work is a way to survive and allow the visibility and the speech for others to be included because another work of this is about finding the space of inclusiveness because sometimes you know when it, this is why it was so important when you know you raise this question of diversity it's in 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 whose in whose inclusiveness in whose space that is that's not for everybody you know so i i think it, the work needs to continue Forever, forever. Otherwise, they come to a point. What stories we're we going to say then is, ah, oh, we've done the work. There's not. No, it's about power relations. It's about power and a lot of power of oppression, not only coming from if you, institutions or government or whatever, but it comes by human beings. It comes by men and it also comes by women, and it depends on what status you hold in society and what you want to do with populations. You know, in Gabon, they will kill you. They kill their own population. They, they don't care about their population, they invest in their own power, but they, they don't have a sympathy or sensibility to their own uh, history and what happens to the population now, and the creativity and the resistance and the history that is being produced is being boom. So you need to 
you know, that, that's what I mean. You need actually tradition is about reinvention, constant reinvention is about renewing these ideas, getting, you know, going and infiltrating within different communities, even that are so not your own, because it's challenging. I have to say, sometimes it's very challenging to work with somebody, to have a collaboration. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you have to build these differences, and these differences will set your position and know where you're going. No? Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, Nikita, you were asking, um, as a main question for this panel discussion, can the artists function as an agent of decolonization, uh, or are they part of the very structure they are trying to resist? I think now we have a lot of answers to that. And um, I don't think, unfortunately, we'll have time to see the video of Kadaratia. I would rather use a few minutes, how many minutes we have left? Two, 10, five, five to 10, uh, for a couple of questions. And uh, we will gather two questions, and then we will have five more minutes, yeah? yeah. Hello, my name is Michael Kupas, ADBC, from Afrotech TV, Cyber Nomads. Gina, when you, you? when you were here you? in 2000, uh, okay. when you were here in 2010, I realized that even the name of Bella Fonte needs a lot of rereading in Germany, mm -hmm. because, um, I'm, I'm not sure that, that many people know uh, what he did in, 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 in the 60s with the march on Washington, etc. In Germany, Harry Belafonte most of the time just stands for the Kokanata song. Kokanata Kakan, you know, the smiling black African, uh, African American. And that's, that's the way it has been written into German consciousness. So even for the black community, we, we need to re-liberate ourselves and our own histories. Do we have another question? No, so Sibon, you can answer to that. Uh, well, it wasn't a question, it was a statement. Um, yeah, I think um, in many, many people in the United States as well um, uh, don't know about the activism uh, side of my father's work as much as his uh, musical contribution and his acting contribution. He's kind of funny. He says he's the greatest actor in the world. And when asked, well, why do you say that? Because, you know, maybe there's some others that might be better at acting. And he's like, because I've convinced all of you that I'm a singer. <laughs> um, but yes, his work has been... Um, quite consistent in the United States in the civil rights movement, and also not just the civil rights movement, but simultaneously during that time, he was, um, he, one of his mentors was Eleanor Roosevelt, who was um, a very profound woman uh, from the United States, and she actually was the one who introduced him to Tom Mboya, which then he began to learn more about African liberation movements and began to support them and be more engaged in them and travel more and seek more uh, information. And then um, after seeing a film by the name of Come Back Africa, he then sought out um, this young singer who was in the film uh, to engage her and to bring her music to the American main stage, and that was Miriam Makeba. Um, and she was then later known as Mama Africa uh, in her music, um, which, again, is interesting how we put these symbols on people because, um, you know, she emerged and she was discovered, and sh so she becomes the voice, and this is how uh, we do a lot of things. You know, we, we tend to look for the savior, the leader, the anointer, the one person that we can identify as, um, and I don't want to take anything away from her. She was fantastic. She was amazing. Uh, and she also uh, was part of the American liberation experience. Um, but yeah, so I encourage everyone here to see the film that I produced on the life of my father. It's called Sing Your Song. Um, last year, I had the good fortune to uh, show it at Radial Systems here in, in Berlin. Um, but if you can find it, I highly recommend that you watch it. Uh, and it'll give you a much deeper dive and understanding on uh, who Harry Belafonte is and how he's contributed and, and what he's doing now. He's 91 now. 
Thank you so much for your time and for your attention. I think we will have a break of 15 minutes. And uh, voila, merci beaucoup, beaucoup. It was incredible to have to speak with the two of you on this panel Thank discussion. You, Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for moderating us. Appreciate it.